examples, or we could call it an All Request Tuesday because I'm responding to a request that was made for that. So I, that shows that I listened to too much radio growing up, I think, that I, I know these things. Uh, at least I haven't called it Rocktober yet, so knock on wood. Um, there's still time, right, right. Um, there will be a quiz, and the quiz will be a similar format as before. If I remember right, there was like three questions, and it was available online from Friday over the weekend till Tuesday or something like that. So it'll be the same thing this time. If anyone knows any good questions, let me know because I haven't <laughs> I haven't made it up yet. So yeah, right, right. Probably not. Yeah, I mean, anything in the class is fair game. But, you know, it is open book and open note, so that, that, uh, that mitigates. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. I will. All right. Okay, maybe we can make up the quiz together then. <laughs> All right. The first example is a SQLite database example that I found. found a real nice, nifty little example and I posted a link to it and we're going to look at it. Um, first thing we're going to do is, is as, as is a practice, I'll, I'll show you how it behaves, show you what it does, and then, then we'll look at uh, the code for it. I may have wisened up and locked the device so that it doesn't keep flipping orientation. So knock on wood, that will work and that will, that will keep me from trying to look trying to juggle these things. Anyhow, let me run this database sample. And I did not want to do that. There we go. Pardon me? Flip the projector, right, right. Okay, this isn't elegant, but it, it works. There is, there are two buttons that you can run in this application. One to save data, one to check data. Uh, really, save data is to enter and save data. Check data is to list the data that's already been entered. So, um, let me click, click check data because I believe, whoops. Okay, no, I, that's right, I uninstalled this. So, um, apparently it got rid of the database with it. So, I'll hit the back button to go to the previous activity, and I'll click Save Data, and I'll put in some contact information. There's just some text boxes here that I can enter. Mike, extension 4796, Skype, I don't do Skype. Address BU211 J, my office, and I'll click Save. Does its thing? It says, Whoa. Oh. You've saved successfully. Do you want to add another? I click No, and it goes back to the menu. Now if I click check data, it shows me the data that I've entered. If I leave the application, and even if I terminate it, oh, I don't have the terminator application on here, but if I go back to it, um, trust me, it's persistent, so it, it saves it. We can go and enter another piece of data in. and both those pieces of data are in the database table. So very straightforward. Um, it does, you know, what you'd, uh, the basic uh, updating data, not update in the database sense, but inserting data into the database, and then it does uh, a listing. So let's take a look at this application. And I like to go through everything in the application. Uh, 
but we'll focus on, on the stuff that's important, the database stuff for this. Um, let's see, anything interesting in the manifest? Um, yeah, there is um, the, the, uh, the, the, the um, let's see, the activity that we're firing here. It also lists that there are actually a couple other activities in here, which I think might be our first example of, of, of a couple activities. If you think of an activity, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to correspond to a screen, but it's like one thing that you want the user to do. So um, you want the user to see is one activity, see the data, you want the, the user to enter data, and then you have the menu. So that's, that's three activities, the main plus the other two. If we look at, there's our string file, nothing fascinating in there. In fact, gasp, this guy hard-coded some strings. <gasps> Android text equals check data. Ooh, bad programmer, bad pro. Well, he gave us a great example for free, so we'll, we'll, we'll let him off the hook on this one. We'll, we'll let him off with a stern warning. Uh, as opposed to, to anything uh, else. If you notice, he has a screen for each, uh, or, or a layout for each, uh, each of the three activities. The save activity has a bunch of labels uh, and um, which, text views and, and some edit text controls that allow you, you know, that, that show the things that you need to enter in, along with a couple of buttons on the bottom there. The main is a couple of buttons, and the check is a list view that, of course, um, can grow as, as more and more things get added to it. All right, I think that's about it on this one. Okay. Like this. Okay. Well, cool. Well, you know you have to give it the ID uh, Android ID slash list. It has to be called that. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Now let's look at the code and we have Essentially, um, three activities. Here's our main activity, the database sample. We then have an activity for save data, which also extends activity. And check data, which extends, ac uh, extends list activity. And then we have a data manipulator class, which is the guy that's doing all the database stuff. All right. So if we look at the, the example, it is pretty simple. It actually is one of those where we're, because it's simple enough, we have this uh, implement um, the on-click listener. So it's its own on-click listener, <laughs> all right? Um, in essence, all it does is it grabs pointer to, uh, it grabs pointers to both the buttons, sets the on-click listener of those buttons to itself, and waits for you to click on one of the two. When you click on the two, it looks to see which button you've clicked on. Um, again, the on-click event has uh, an argument of a view, so whatever view you click on gets passed to this guy. All right, and therefore we identify what view that is by grabbing the ID of that argument view, and then we switch, and we do one of two things. Either we start the save activity, or we start the um, check data or, or list data activity. So pretty straightforward. Question? Yeah. It, it, it's just variables for the intents. All right. The intent is a new intent. The context will be this. All right, in other words, it's going to be started like within this activity. And the save data class is the activity that you are. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that kind of a new syntax saving save class. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Let's look at the intent constructor. Because that's a good question. I'm no longer going to be receiving updates of Google Chrome because this machine is too old. So anyone out there that wants to, to donate uh, money, uh, I will put my PayPal account up on the screen uh, later on today. <laughs> oh, what the heck? And we're going to have to wrestle with it to recognize the certificate and so on and so forth. Actually, I'll just do this. Go to the council computer. Yeah. Think that I bought it in spring of 2006. So it's over, over six years old, yeah. And I didn't keep up with the operating system updates. Uh, I'm not very good at managing my disk space, so I probably have every digital photo I've ever taken on here. Uh, and and if, if, if I only had that, I probably would have extra disk space. But I probably have copies of every digital photo because I'll start to edit one and you've got to keep the original, of course, and whatever. But at any rate, um, so I have not upgraded um, operating systems in a long time. One thing I will say, and, and this is back to when I first was doing Java stuff. Learn your way around these Java docs. It, it takes a little while to because it can be a little confusing, but they're gold once you, you know, the, once you get uh, um, an idea of how they are, and, and you've gone through it a few times. All right. So that was a constructor on that. So let's scroll down till we see the constructors. Okay, intent. All right. This is the constructor that we're calling, right? Because we're not calling the empty intent. We're not calling it with an intent. We're not calling it with a string that contains an action. Uh, we're not containing a string for the action along with the URI. We are calling it with a context and with a class. The context being sort of what it's running in and the class being the class of the intent that we want to call. Interface to, pro to, pro to global information about an application environment. All right. Okay. So, I don't know about this. All right. At any rate, we create one of these two intents depending on which of the buttons that we pressed. Let's look, let's do it in order and let's look at the save data one first. So we bring up the save data one and this goes in and does its standard sort of thing, sets the content view. Um, this also is an activity that because it's, it's pretty simple, it's this activity here. with the series of text boxes and the two buttons, it also, the activity also implements the on-click listener. So it's doing its own listening for events. And then we're going to go and look at the, um, look at the idea of what view got hit. Was it button A or button B? And then we decide what we're going to do based on that. Okay. So, on-click. All right. We do the same thing. We grab the view that got clicked, look at the ID, if the ID was button 01 home, which is actually the second button, the back button, in essence we just get out of Dodge. 
we start a new intent to go back to our first page and, and we sort of cancel out of that. So if we click this button, we're just back to the menu. All right. But that's no fun. So activities too have a method they call on. Now they have almost Right. Right, right, yeah. So, now if they click this guy, all right, we go through and we grab all the values from the text boxes. We create a new instance of our data manipulation object and set our DH to it, our data handler. Then we call DH insert and we pass um, our, our four parameters to it. Our four parameters being the four text boxes. All right. And we have a create dialog that looks and, and um, sees if we have saved it correctly and we go back to the menu or not. All right. Now let's look at the data manipulator class because that's the one that's doing all the fun. All right. We have in here some parameters. We have a string for the database name, a string for the database version, a string for the new table that we want to create, cleverly called new table, um, our context, and a static SQL-like database. We really don't need an instance of that class. We just need, we, we need to just call some methods, some static methods on it. So we just save ourselves some trouble of having to declare an instance just by making a, a, a static, uh, a static uh, variable for that. Because we're not really creating an instance, we just want to call some of those methods. All right, now, the constructor of it sets the, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I forget in Java, if you neglect to put the private, does that mean it defaults to public? Uh, yeah, I believe it does. I would assume that that's just an oversight in this case. I, I wouldn't think that they would want to do that. Um, I don't see any reason for doing that. Yes? We're, we're calling That's a good question. We probably don't, but it. I just Yeah, that, that'd be a good that'd be a good test, but I believe I believe we wouldn't have to. Oh, so that's why. Okay, so, so the, the uh, yeah, because the other classes can then access this variable DB directly. Okay. Makes sense. Right. All right. We then have a. Uh, our constructor, we have one constructor on this that accepts a context, and so we set the context. It uh, creates a open helper object, and it sets the data manipulation to essentially grab a writable database. All right, uh, grab a pointer to the uh, database and set that as our static uh, object db. Let's see. Let me look at my screen here. Um, get writable database. Okay. Now, if we look at this, a 
missing something here that I saw earlier. Oh, the open helper. All right, that's what I'm missing here. On create the database, all right. When I create this, it's going to go and it's going to create the database. It's going to create that table on the database when I create it. So this helper is, um, when it is created, it is going to create this database. Now, notice that it is looking uh, at the on change. There's also another event for on upgrade. In other words, if the version number of the database is different than the version number uh, that the database is supposed to be. The version number being this guy up here. All right. And if it does that, then it drops that table. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the override is to do nothing. Uh, so you, you code in there to drop the table, which seems kind of kind of rude. But um, there's probably, yeah, there's, there's you know, um, I imagine there, there's, um, there's other stuff that you could do. Yeah. Right. Doing something like, like upgrade it, maybe run some sort of SQL statement to up, update it or, or whatever. Uh, notice here, by the way, the open of it is going to uh, call the super and it is going to ask the, 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 for the database name, the database version, and other things. When that database is found not to exist, the onCreate method kicks in and that's what uh, creates it and creates the table. Correct. Okay. Correct. Create table. There's uh, with, with SQL. There are um, a couple different flavors of of SQL. You typically, generically, people just call it SQL. But there's actually DDL, which is data definition language, which is things like creating tables, dropping tables, creating an index, creating a foreign key, and that sort of thing. There's also DML, which is data manipulation language which is things like the insert statement, the update statement, and the delete statement. Uh, finally, there is uh, really the SQL, which are the queries, select, star, from, table, or something like that. Typically, people generically refer to all those as SQL, where in reality, there's actually little, little subdivisions of that. All right, so now we've constructed that, and we're ready to call the insert. There is, and this should look awful familiar. Patrick, did you have the .NET class here? The CISS 216, or, or I'm sorry, 243. Uh, I had the C sharp and uh, C sharp. Okay. Okay. Did you have the web database integration? No. Okay. I'm a okay. This still probably will look familiar. Insert into table name. And the table name's that variable. It could have hard coded it, but yeah, I suppose it's better to do it this way. Values equal question mark question mark question mark question mark. Those question marks are parameters, effectively, and it's the same thing in ASP.NET. Those are placeholders for the actual values. And just like in .NET, you got to tell it before it executes that statement where to get the values for those. Well, guess what? We bind position one with the name position. Whoops. Or, or parameter one with the name, parameter two with the number, three with the Skype ID, four with the address. I had to look twice to see that this didn't start numbering with zero. All right, I, I was amazed by that. Unless there's something I'm missing. Pardon me. Well, in other words, if you look here, they're putting the name in parameter one. Normally, every other thing in programming that would be parameter zero. Right? I was just surprised not to see that as a parameter zero, that they actually started numbering like people actually count with <laughs> number one. But yeah, uh, that's the case. So what happens again is in this insert statement, we do a bind string, which means 
to substitute the value of this variable name, the argument that gets passed in, into argument or parameter, whatever you want to call it, one in the SQL statement. Then we do the phone number in the two, the Skype ID in the three, and the address into four. And then make it so. We issue the insert, uh, we tell the insert statement to go and execute. And now it has its, its parameters filled and we can go in and complete the insert. We don't have a commit statement because I don't believe we've started a transaction. All right. Uh, this example didn't do transaction processing where you typically need a commit when you start a transaction, execute a bunch of statements, and then you say commit to, to finalize it. Like for example, if you're doing uh, an accounting entry, you know, an accounting entry is always debits and credits, right? And you might be inserting into a transaction table. Well, if the for some reason you posted the, the debit successfully but it blew up trying to post the credit, you want that whole transaction to fail, right? You don't want the debit to be posted in isolation from the credit. So what you do in that case is you create what's called a database transaction to say I'm going to treat these insert statements or update statements or whatever they are as a unit. And they all have to succeed or they, or they all will fail. So that way you don't get like a half-baked transaction, you know. Uh, you know, either 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 the, the database updated with both halves, debits and credits, or it didn't update at all. Either one of those is a tolerable situation for, you know, for an accounting application. So, so it, looks, it looks like to me that we're going to write against the database and copy in memory copy of the database that we would apply our changes to and then Yeah, I I would I would agree with that. That, that certainly seems to be the case. Now, um, let's see. Going back here, no, which one? But this one? Oh, the save data one. Sure looks to me like it doesn't even bother testing if it succeeded or not. It just displays that. <laughs> that dialogue saying that you added one, you want to add another. You know, so, uh, you know, it, it, that, that I guess would be a drawback of this example. It doesn't look like it's really, really doing any trapping and who knows if there was an error. Now, I noticed when they created the table, they didn't create any kind of primary key and didn't put any kind of constraints on it. So, Presumably, I could add two mics in there or, or whatever, and, and it wouldn't gripe about it. But again, you know, this is just a, a simple example to kind of get, get, uh, get used to it. The light, the, light. the light one, yeah. I would imagine all you'd really need to do is wrap that, wrap this guy, or maybe both these guys, in a try-catch. And depending on the try-catch, show a different dialog. Um, if, 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 the try -catch, if nothing happened with the try-catch, show the succeeded. If, um, if the, 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 the try-catch caught an error of some kind, then, then display a different dialogue saying, sorry, sorry, Charlie, didn't work this time. All right. Now, the last bit is our activity for checking data. And... Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the one that displays the data in a list. So, these are my old, these are an old pair of glasses, so I'm having a hard time seeing the screen. Um, All right, create a new data manipulator. So we create a new one of these guys. Ah, and we call names 
equals our data manipulator select all. So we go back to our data manipulator. There we go. And our select all goes in and we create a, um, a uh, array list. We create a, a, a cursor for a query. All right. And what a cursor will allow us to do effectively is to loop through a result set. So we run a query and we're doing a query looking from this table all these different string values. And we are sorting it ascending by name. I'm not sure what the nulls are in this cursor command. It could be um, like filtering properties, like if we only were looking for certain people, or, you know, people that had a certain address or whatever. I, I have to confess I'm not sure what that is. So what a cursor is, is a mechanism that allows you to iterate through a result set. All right. So we move to first. If that succeeded, it means that we have at least one. If that doesn't succeed, we don't have any. All right. So we move to the first. If that succeeds, we do as long as we can move to the next. When move to the next returns false, that means we've hit the end of the line. All right. So cursor move first points at the first one, assuming there is a first one. All right. If that's false, we pop to the end. We then will execute this loop each iteration through and we grab from the cursor element 0, which is the ID, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Interestingly enough, there's our element 0. Maybe, maybe, maybe the assumption is when we create the table. Let me let's, let's look at that create table again. Ah, didn't pay attention. Integer primary key. Ah. All right, that's why there's no zero there. Would have been the key. Yeah. Ah. So zero is vindicated. So we're looping through and we're creating an array. Um, we're actually creating a list of arrays. The array is B1, the new array that we're creating, and that contains five or six elements, right? The ID, the name, the, the phone number, the Skype ID, and the address. So each iteration through it, we create one of those arrays for B1, and then we add that B1 to the list. And then we increment x, and we do that over and over and over again. When we're done, we return that list to whoever called it. In, that, in this case, it is a check data, which is going to go, and now it's going to do kind of the reverse thing. It's going to go, and it's going to parse that out and output to the list. Yes. Yes, the array adapter, I believe, yeah, binds that to the simple list item. Okay. So we create the array. We, yeah, we create the array. We loop through. We form our entry. We then go and effectively, like you said, bind that that array to the list view and then we're, we're back displaying the code. Now, yeah. Now, um, what was I going to say here? Oh, 
Notice that. How do I want to say this? Let me tell you what they could have done. All right? And then, then we'll talk about why this is better. It kind of seems goofy. It, it might at first pass seem goofy to do this. Do the database query, grab a cursor, loop through that cursor, create an array, return the array to this, loop through that, or, or actually to this, loop through that array, create another array, and then use that to populate the, 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 the list view. But I would say that that's not goofy at all. That's probably good practice. Anyone care to, to, uh, care to describe why I would think that that's a good practice and that's not overkill or too goofy? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say because you're, you're separating your data access from your data. Yep. Separating the data access from the presentation. Exactly. You have, you have a chunk of code that's responsible for hitting the database, grabbing it, returning an array. And then what you do with that array, well, that's the UI's business. All right. So if we wrote one block of code to do all that, then all those functions would be uh, intertwined. All that functionality would be intertwined if we were doing the database access and creating that array for the list view and doing all that. Then it would be harder um, if we wanted to pull those functions apart and maybe do something else with that. Um, go ahead. Well, well, notice notice the query that we're doing. It seems like we're doing a lot of a lot of coding well, in database, right? as opposed to using Well, yeah. The query itself, we are sorting ascending by name. So we do that in the query. So we're getting our result set back sorted by name. So we don't really need to do any sorting of the result set because the result set's already sorted in the manner that we want it. So we, are we doing the cursor then and building then because? When, when this statement executes, cursor has effectively like a table of data, has a result set of data. And the cursor allows us to point to those elements of data and loop through them. But those elements are in name order because our SQL statement was sorted by name, ascending. So in other words, when we do get first, that is the lowest alphabetical name. When we do get next, we're getting the next alphabetical name and so on down the line. So there's really no need to sort it because each trip through, we're we're getting that. Now the, the method name select all that just seems kind of like a you know, like a plain name. Yeah, it does. Select all. Well, maybe it is. I, maybe I just don't understand what it's doing. What what it's doing is it's querying the table. Yeah. It's pulling it's pulling everything from a table. Okay. And, and, and the, the statement that does that in SQL is the select statement. So that's probably where they got it. We don't see the select statement because dbquery allows us to build it, the select statement without knowing the exact syntax of a select statement. We, we tell it the table, we tell it the columns that we want. Uh, I'm not sure what those nulls are, <laughs> but then the last part is the order by. Repeat that, please. Yes. That could be. Yeah, that could be. Um, oh, I. I don't like to be on a browser other than Chrome because I like to just type my query up in the user bar. And I know other browsers do that, but 
I'm suspicious of them. What those nulls are, are a wear clot. Oh, we're not looking at it. Thank you. I was doing so good, too. What those nulls are, are a wear clause, a selection argument so that we could plug into the wear clause, a group by, a having clause, and an order by. So we don't have any any group by, or I'm sorry, we don't have any where clause, so we don't have any where clause parameter, so we don't, and we don't have any group by, and we don't have any having clause. So, uh, but we do have an order by, so that's why the last one's there. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm guessing there's probably another way to write this without using the DB query um, command where you could write the full SQL statement, you know, if you're more comfortable with SQL. Or if you had a more more involved query, um, but that allows you to, to bang out. You know, the, the idea is is this is after all SQL light, right? So uh, it probably just allows you to bang out quick little queries. You know, um, with with minimal effort. Do you know if uh, SQL light is what you must use with Android? I do not know that. Um, but I know someone who does. Android database options. All right. Use share preferences for primitive data, internal device storage for private data, external storage for large data sets that are not private. Use SQLite database for structured storing. Yeah, so you do have some options. SQLite. Alternative. Right. Android persistence alternative to SQLite. Is there any other alternative to SQLite in Android? Do you need a simple store for use, use shared? Um, if you are looking for something more powerful that compares to core data, you should give green DAO. So, yeah. You almost can guess that, like, if the question is, is there an alternative or the option, that the answer is yes, <laughs> you know, uh, that someone has a library to do it somewhere, all right. Okay. Questions about that one? The next one is the, sp oh, no problem. Next one is the spot on gain. That will at least start talking about this today. This is great because my daughter is like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm preparing for class, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, come on, give, give me a break. Yeah, right, right, right. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, she's probably old enough now that if I'm playing Mario Karts for her to say, look, you guys are not 
riding Mario Karts. That one I know. Okay. In this game, you got to hit these guys before they disappear. They're, the animation is that they move and they get smaller and they move at different rates. If you if any of them goes through this whole animation sequence and disappears, you lose a life until you have no more lives remaining. And I think as you get so many, you gain a life, gain an extra life. So notice I'm gaining life there. And you gain points and so on until you're done. Doesn't appear to be. That had me puzzled for a while. Yeah, it could be. But yeah, that had me puzzled for a while. Let's look at what's interesting about this. And, and the main thing in my mind that's interesting about this is the animation. Because we're doing animation a little bit differently than, we're, than, than we did before. Uh, this is the preferred method for, I guess, uh, Android uh, 3.0 and higher or 3. Point something and higher to do animation like we're doing uh, in this example. Uh, the rest of it is pretty not terribly exciting, but I, I think the animation part is interesting. So we'll review it, but our focus probably will be on, on the animation thing. So included in here is a real fun statement. Syntax had me confused for a second. Let's delete that so I'm not confused. Let's close these guys. All right. Nothing excited in uh, manifest. Okay. Well, good thing there's nothing exciting in it then. <laughs> yeah. Oops, wrong. There we go. Um, this does require a, a higher SDK than some of the other ones because of that. I don't know if it needed that or not, but that's what I set it to. Um, under resources. Basic strings. Um, our different sounds is MP3s. If you hit, if you miss, and if it makes it all the way through its animation. So the hit is the one sound. If you tap a portion of the screen that's not one of the little guys that's flying, that's a miss. And the disappears if it goes all the way through its animation and you haven't hit it. In other words, he's, he's gone. All right. Layout. Nothing uh, terribly interesting here. Down on the bottom is where the lives appear. The, the, there's the, the text and the levels and all that. Um, Untouched is the layout for the image view that's going to be flying across the screen. And this is the, the lives that show up in the bottom, the, the layout for that. Um, all right, on to the code. This again has uh, a view of its own that, that creates, let me see, yeah, that creates um, the spot on view. So the spot on activity creates the custom spot on view. Does a few things after you pause and, and resume, all right, but really nothing big going on there. Most of the work goes on in the spot on view. Has all this parameters and all that. Now, it has a couple of um, cues, all right? 
One for the image views, those represent the images that are flying around the screen, the spots. Then there's one for the animation. All right. In a nutshell, all right, there's going to be a spot object and there, or a, a spot image that's flying across the screen. There's also going to be an animation associated with that object. So the two go together. Those two arrays are, are in sync. All right. Um, could have been done another way, perhaps. You could make a class for a spot that would contain both or whatever, but this is the way that they did it. So we have two lists of these, and uh, one is a, an image view, one is an animation, and we're keeping track of that because each one has a slightly different animation. All right, And we need a pointer to that animation so that we can cancel that animation if the object gets destroyed for example, if we've, if we've tapped on it. So we need, we, we can't just assign the animation to the image and let it go at that, right? We need to be able to refer to that. That's why we have an array both for the spots and for that. Okay. So, as we go through, We initialize some things. We create a spot handler. Uh, and the spot handler Add, yeah, it calls add new spot. And what it does, yeah, this is a method where we want to spend our time. It effectively randomizes uh, a couple of things, or, or a couple of pairs of things. It randomizes the x, y coordinates. So, where the spots pop up and how big they are. and the direction they go, all those things uh, depend on just uh, random generation. All right. We then go and create our spot, which we use the layout inflator to create and inflate that untouched XML, uh, one that we had way down here the untouched XML, to create that and add that spot to our list of spots. Okay. We then set some parameters on that spot and we decide if it's going to be a red or a green spot and, and set the image accordingly. We set the, the, spar the starting point and all that. And we set an on-click listener for that spot. That on click lister is going to be seen if we hit that spot. Because if we hit that spot, something has to happen. We get some points and the spot disappears and, and other things happen. So as we create the spot, we are defining as an uh, you know, uh, um, anonymous listener a uh, on click listener for it. So when we touch it, we call it and we pass the spot that got hit. All right. Then we add it to the view. Now. This statement is what goes and sets the animation. All right. Actually, I was mistaken when I said that this is the size of the spot, x and y. This relates to the um, direction the animation is going to go. All right. That, that relates to, that's actually like a delta x and delta y. All right, not, not the size of it. I was mistaken when I said that. Like, as soon as I said that, I thought, no, I'm not sure if that's right, because they all sure look the same size. But, again, yeah, what that relates to is that relates to, uh, or, yeah, that relates to the X and Y, and 
along with an animation time which must be declared elsewhere because I don't see it. Now, this statement is a little confusing. All right. A lot happening in that. Spot.animate.x x2, y, y2, scale, scale x, scale, scale y. What is that doing? We've all seen syntax like this, right? Or I imagine we have. I'll use uh, an example from the intro to Java class where we had a trip class that had an automobile associated with it, right? So we could have a trip class. One of its attributes is an automobile. And there's a get automobile function on the trip. All right. Then the automobile class might have a get miles per gallon on it. All right. So we've seen syntax like this where we'd say trip t equals new trip blah, 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 blah. Then we could say t dot get automobile dot get mpg. All right. So what does that syntax mean? That syntax means for the trip, get the automobile, and whatever automobile you return, call its get mpg method. All right. So you're sort of chaining those method calls. You're saying, I know that T, get automobile, returns that trip's automobile. And so whatever object it returns, whatever automobile object it returns, I can call the get MPG method on. It's just a nice little shorthand to do it that way. Um, sometimes developers like to do that to, to have fun. All right. Just to, to make the code very terse and all that. And that's a good thing, except when it renders it incomprehensible. All right. Now, what are we doing here? All right. In this case, we are calling spot.animate. All right. We must be getting something back from that call, right? And what and and what we're getting back actually, according to this is our animation listener adapter or wait a minute. Well, well, we'll see. Whatever we're getting back from that, we are calling an x function on it. Whatever we are getting back from that x function, we're calling a y function. Whatever we're getting back from that, we're calling the scale x. Whatever we're getting back from that, we're calling the scale y, and so on. Well, let's look to see what we're getting back from that method. All right. So if we go to These guys are, after all, image views. So let's look at the image view Java doc. Uh, I don't know what it is about this page, but it takes forever to load these Java docs. Something doesn't like Internet Explorer. All right. If we look at what we're really interested first off is what I want to find out if I'm looking at this is I know spot is an image view. There must be on an image view a method called animate. All right. Let's see what the animate method on an image view does. 
Well, here's the methods, ain't one, all right? Well, you know what that means, right? It's, it's on one of the ancestors, all right? So we go down here and let's see, okay, let's see what the, what's on the view. Isn't that a TV show? Let's see what's on the view. I said, let's not confuse it with that. With, yeah. All right, let's. Yeah, right, right. Hey, maybe that's what I need. Maybe I need sponsors that I can get uh, an upgrade to my laptop. Yeah, I'll be in. Uh, yeah, I'll be in one of these days, and I'll like have uh, some brand, and I'll have like the the cat or whatever, like right here, and you'll know that. Uh... <laughs> I actually, I actually have my database design videos. I get a bunch of hits. For some of the other ones, uh, I don't get so much, and it, and it takes a while to build up. But like the the intro to database uh, design, uh, those those I get a bunch of hits on. So yeah, I, I don't know, uh, not necessarily all of them, but on those I do. All right, let's see. Let's scroll down. Public constructors, public methods, okay. Animate. What does that return? It returns a view, property, animator. All right. So it returns a view, property, animator object, which is used to animate specific properties on this view. In other words, in essence, the function animate returns the object that is used to animate whatever view that we call that on. So in this case, I say, yeah, exactly. So if I say spot.animate, what it's doing is it's calling the animate method on that spot. That animate method returns an object whose responsibility is to animate spot. So let's look at what this guy's methods are. Okay. Yeah, you could you could always use uh, you know that we, we have devices that you could use if, if if you would need to do this in an assignment. Now notice what all this returns. All these methods, all right, that are part of that animator object, they return an animator object. All right, so it returns itself. So. If I set one of these properties, if I call, what's the first method I call? Clever. It's like, yeah, exactly. So I call on that spot animate grabs that view property animator. On that view property animator, which is responsible for animating the spot, I call X. What do I call? Yeah, I call X. So. What does X do? X causes the view's X property to be animated to the specific value, and oh yeah, it returns itself back. So if you want to call another method on it, you can just chain those methods one after another. So each one of these methods does its thing, sets a property for the animation, and then returns itself. Like, you got more you want to do? All right, dot rotate. So we could rotate this. 
Got more that you want to do? Let's set the X. Got more that you want to do? Set this. So you effectively can chain all these settings of the animation, which is confusing when you look at it, but once you see it, pretty straightforward and it, it allows for a lot terser code. So we could add any of these on here. Okay, objection. <laughs> Overruled. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but I guess there's so many parameters. There's so many parameters. In other words, in other words, if all you wanted to do was move it in one direction, you wouldn't want to have a function that had 56 null parameters that you had to call. All right. Also, you wouldn't want to have, given that there's so many parameters and so many potential combinations, you wouldn't want to like overload that because. You could overload X and Y, and X and rotation, you know, it would just get to be confusing. So, this sort of technique is done. Yeah. Um, so, we could add any of these methods on here. I was playing around with this, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so you, that's very powerful. Yeah. Basically, do a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Just that one statement. Yep. So, yeah, once you figure it out, right. So, we can slap a rotation on this. Or we can slap a rotation X in it. Want to do that? Sure. Let's go in here. Probably doesn't. Rotation. I don't know what I, I don't know what that's rated and if that's in degrees or what. But let's go and run this guy. Right. Right. Okay. So now they're rotating. Okay, or there is, what's the other one? I'm sure you could. Well, whatever that rotation number is, yeah, it would cause it to, to rotate it. We could make it faster or smaller or randomizing it. Let's, go ahead. I'm going to change it to rotate the X. And again, this is, this is a case of like, you know, what, when you run into an example like this, of course you got to play with every stupid thing, even though you're never gonna, you're never <laughs> necessarily gonna do it, because you might. But it's fun. Yeah, right, right. But more important than that, it's fun. Okay, here's the rotation. They're flipping like coins. Yeah, which presumably would make them harder to hit. Now you can hit them, but yeah. All right. So again, by by chaining those function calls, you can go and you can do a lot with the with the um, animation of it. And again, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do for this. This is a specific kind of of animation called uh, a tween animation, whereas you you sort of just specify um, specify some parameters and go and do it, as opposed to sort of the, the, the random chaotic animation that, you know, that where you like hand draw animation like that. That's sort of a different sort of, of animation. All right. Yeah, I believe this would be characterized as a tween animation. Because again, you're, you're, you're supplying parameters and letting it come up with that.
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a great environment. Uh, it's a great environment to, to play with. Right. Let's see. Yeah, I, I, again, a number of type, uh, property animations are introduced in Android 3.0 and are a type of tween animation, yeah. Okay, the opposite being frame by frame. Any questions about this? The frame by frame is that the draw? That would be like, yeah, well, essentially where you draw it, yeah. Questions about any of this? I did run into, uh, what, what was it? Oh, I was using an Android app to try to sign on to a service and um, I got my password wrong. You know, it, it was, it assumed because it was the first character of something it should be uppercase so it, and the password was case sensitive. But it did the little animation like we did in our flag thing where it shook back and forth for a second. It's like, yes, I know this. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. All right. Uh, again, to remind you, the quiz should be available like Friday through Tuesday of next week. Um, the class Thursday. Um, if you have any special requests, I don't know if Ben will be here, but um, you know we'll come in and you know maybe we'll talk about some of these things. Maybe we'll play with the animations, or if you have some specific questions in mind, we'll take a shot with that. All right. We'll s see you later. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. to do it. Right, sure. Processes, right. All the right. Okay. Right. Right. And so I stopped. I processed there were eight threads. Uh -huh. But when I closed it, there were nine. And when I closed it, there were only eight. So I was actually closing the thread. Right. But there were still eight lines to have. Right. Right. And so again, I saw another issue. Right. Oh, excellent. Um, the, yeah, the one thing, one thing that I mentioned in One of the, when I got my first Android phone, they, they recommended like the first app I download be this app killer, all right? Because otherwise, you're right. 
you know, the app sits out there and, and it can be a drain, it can be a drain on your battery, it can be, you know, uh, drain resources and all that. So you can go, and again, if they weren't careful about managing all that, you can just go and periodically whack everything. Well, I can go through, you know, Yeah, you know that that might not have been uh, that might not have been available when I got it, and I just got to, got used to doing that. So yeah, they they, they could have very well have uh, enhanced that.